Brandy, thank you very much for sharing that. I, I think that's a wonderful testament to how uh, you obey God in the moment. An opportunity to obey God leads to being able to share about how you love the Lord and what that means, and then being able to have that conversation, you're blessing others. That's exactly the focus that we're having this morning and how we take the opportunity to obey what God brings to our attention. We're blessed by it, and in doing so, bless others by it. And a wonderful example of that in real time, in a class setting situation, one of our youth able to share in conversation about Jesus. And that's what it's about, taking opportunities in an obedient manner, being blessed by them, growing from them, learning from them, seeing how the Lord's at work through them, and in doing so, blessing others and seeing how the Lord will be at work through those blessings as well. So let's focus on that by turning to Exodus 19. Let's continue that focus, Exodus 19, 4 through 6. Bless others as you have been blessed is the sermon title. The focus is how we are to obey God, live into his blessings, and live a life that invites others to do the same. So as we obey God, we're inviting others to experience his blessings because we are being blessed. It's exemplified by the way in which we are living because we're obeying God. And in doing so, others are blessed. Exodus 19 will begin our focus here on how God sets this tone. Hopefully you were there, Exodus 19, starting with verse 4. Stand with me if you're able, in honor of reading God's word. Let's stand up. Scripture in front of you. The Lord is speaking here. You yourselves, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And this is the word of the Lord, and we pray for God to bless us this morning with his word. So you may be seated. Let's... let's take a step back here and realize the framework of what's happening here. Moses is receiving God's covenant with his people, okay? Israel has been led out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, and now there is a covenant being set in motion, a relationship between God and his chosen people. Why did God set this covenant, this relationship in motion with these people? What, what reason is there behind that? And what outcome is there from that? It's a good question always to ask. It's a question that we're, we're asking a little bit as a church in one regard. If you remember Justin and Angie Ham and their children, missionaries from Belgium who stayed with us for a year, recently went back to Belgium and re-engaging uh, in their network there. I was able to video chat with Justin this past week, and we were talking about how Jersey can prayerfully consider sending several people to Belgium next year. Summertime, Thanksgiving time, you remember the conversations we had? Looking to send a small group team, if you will, for a week to Belgium to partner with them. And so a lot's happening over there as they're getting reacclimated, they're finding their place to live, getting that lined up, so many different things and conversations happening. And, and as I was talking with Justin, I saw Angie as well and was able to speak to both of them, but as I was talking to Justin, was reminded of how Justin processes God's activity. And it's truly a blessing. Justin sees the bigger picture and how to obey what God is bringing to attention and not demand detailed answers, especially in the midst of a lot of questions. So Justin was, was sharing how he's being obedient and trying to prayerfully consider a lot of questions at hand, but there's no panic there's no sense of, of hurry in place here. There's an understanding of God is showing things in time as necessary to obey, and in doing so, receiving blessings along the way, conversations that just would have no other explanation other than they're God-ordained, from him being obedient, the family being obedient to what God's doing in real time. And in doing so, they're able to bless others and hear how God is at work in other people's lives and invite them into experiencing what it means to obey God, love God, and live into his blessings. 
It's a true encouragement when you see another living in such a way. When you see someone else obeying what God is doing in their life, they're being blessed because of it in a number of ways. It's a blessing to you. It's an encouragement to me to hear from Justin how he is processing what God is doing, how he's obeying it, being blessed by it, and thus blessing me. It's an encouragement. Let's remember here as we again encounter Exodus 19, Israel's been brought out of slavery in Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. This covenant is being set in place, and God's people are experiencing God's grace, undeserved favor in a profound way. With this foundational set of experiences for them to understand how God's hand has been upon them, they are understanding that they have a new existence at hand, a reason to live as God ordains it so they can experience God's blessings and thus bless others. They are to be an example of what it means to respond to God's holiness. They are to exemplify to the nations what it means to respond to God's holiness so that as they obey and are blessed, others will be blessed and invited into what it means to respond to God's holiness and revere God live into his commands, and be blessed as well. The non-Israelite, drawn to Israel this way, was expected to learn and submit to God's revealed demands. God set Israel aside to display his holiness and for them to demonstrate how to live according to his will. God uses grace-filled opportunities to bless others as you recognize how he's at work in your life. God uses grace-filled opportunities that you experience in order for others to be blessed. Israel was made to be a treasure, a kingdom, a priestly people, a holy nation. Israel's role was not just for their own sake. Israel's role was not just for Israel's sake. Israel was elected, empowered, and given the opportunity to, to mediate between God and other nations. And this mediation that would occur would expose to others what it means to respond to God's holiness and revere God and live into the blessing he promises as a result of obedience. This is a big responsibility, right? There's an opportunity at hand. There's a purpose here at hand that God is ordaining and setting in motion this covenantal relationship here is, is being put before them, not as an option, as a command, as an opportunity. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how God is ordaining things to happen in existence for his love to be proclaimed and, and experienced. But look at the provision of the covenant, verse 5 in Exodus 19. The provision is this, now if, if you obey me, Israel has an opportunity to not obey. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, the if and then statement, then out of all nations, you'll be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. You'll be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. You'll be the example you're supposed to be. You'll receive the blessings you're supposed to receive, and others will be blessed as well. Now turn with me to Exodus 24. This is laid out there. These words are being spoken to God's people. The covenant is being set in motion. Here is how the covenant's going to happen. If you obey my commands, you obey what I put in front of you, you will be blessed and in turn be blessing others. This is the response. Exodus 24, 1 through 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. 
Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. However, although they said, we will obey, something interesting happened. This covenant being set in motion, this understanding of how you will be blessed as you obey, and in doing so, will proclaim God's holiness, and others will be blessed as well. They said, yes, we'll do it. We're in. We agree. We will respond with obedience. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Something happened. Moses came back down from Mount Sinai. The people I said, it's taken too long. I thought this, this stuff was going to be set in motion immediately, and I would see immediate results, instant gratification, if you will. Deuteronomy 9, 8 through 21. Aaron, Moses' brother, is asked to have a golden calf made so they can pour their worship on that instead of God, because God was taking too long with Moses. Listen to what happened. Verse 8, Deuteronomy 9, At Oreb you aroused the Lord's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you. Yeah, makes sense that he'd be that angry after what they had said, after he had commanded. When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord had made with you, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. The Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of fire on the day of the assembly. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord told me, go down from here at once because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've turned away quickly from what I commanded them and have made an idol for themselves. And the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. Let me alone so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God, and you had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. Then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again the Lord listened to me. And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him, but at that time I prayed for Aaron too. Also, I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf you had made, and burned it in the fire. Then I crushed it and ground it to a powder, fine as dust, and threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. Think of a time you have told God, yes, I'll obey. God brings something to your attention. Yes, I'm in. I'll obey only to almost immediately become disobedient and disillusioned and not do what you had told God you would do. We've all done it, myself included. It's crazy to think about, right? We read it here, and we can almost distance ourselves or disconnect ourselves from really connecting with this type of attitude and action, right? Well, I can't believe that they would literally see Moses and they would understand what's going on and the gravity of the situation, and, and they would agree, and then they would choose to disobey. It's just hard to fathom. It's... It's not that hard to fathom, actually. We've all experienced it. We all do it, right? We, we have this profound experience with God's presence and worship through his word, through prayer and conversation in a number of ways, and we are, are thoroughly understanding what it means to obey God in that moment, and, and we have a trajectory set ahead of us of, of what it means to live into the blessings of that obedience. A day later, maybe hours later, a week later, uh, Never mind, God. I'd rather focus my attention elsewhere. It's crazy, right? I mean, how many times have we, we told God yes, only to become impatient and, or disillusioned? We, we've said, God, I will 
reprioritize my family's priorities right after this ball game. Or God, I promise, I promise I'll show kindness as soon as this guy gets out of my way in the fast lane. Right? I promise, God, I promise that I will, I will obey what you bring to my attention through the church and seeing how you're at work in the community as long as it looks like it did yesterday. Yes, God, I see your activity, the, the fresh expressions of faith you are bringing to my attention in school, at home, at work, with family and friends. I will talk about you. I, I will do what you say knowing that I will be blessed because of it and in turn be blessing others, inviting them into your presence, except when it's too hard and I don't understand all the answers. Israelites were disillusioned. God's taking too long. <laughs> Let's do this by ourselves. Let's get a golden calf and give it our attention. How many golden calves have we had in our lives that removes the chance for us to be blessed and to bless others? And, and we're not going to land on that because it doesn't end there. And we shouldn't live in regret or beat ourselves up when that occurs. But we should recognize God's grace and his profound love that continues to pursue us and move us and show us how to obey once again. I've been in vocational ministry for a good while now, and one of my first opportunities in vocational ministry as youth pastor at a church was a great experience, a challenge, of course, in a number of ways, but a great experience in a smaller youth group at the time. And uh, So getting to know them, enjoying time with them, uh, we would go out to eat a lot. Surprise, shocker, right? Yeah, I know I, I may look like a real trim guy here, but I used to be an even real bigger guy there because we, we'd go out to eat a lot, and I was, I was eating a lot because they'd go out to eat all the time, and we'd always eat a lot, and these, these guys, they could, they could put it down. And I noticed I was gaining quite a bit here, and so I had something had to happen here. I had to stop doing that and eat healthier and move more, exercise, right, so forth, so on. Now, if that knowledge, if I acted like that knowledge was the end goal, just understanding the knowledge of the situation, would that do any good? Right, if, if I exclaimed, I understand what needs to happen, I see the course to follow, to live into the new reality that is, is at hand or needs to be at hand, and then act as if that knowledge alone, simply just the, the head awareness of it alone is sufficient, would anything have changed? Right? I mean, you see the easy connection here, right? How many times do we maybe have the head knowledge of a situation? We understand what God is bringing to our attention. We can read his word, we can have the conversation, we can be in worship, and, and we think about it cognitively but then we miss the opportunity to put it into practice almost as quick as it happened when it was brought to our attention. I bring that to our attention here because it's been happening for a long time, right? So I also, I'm not going to land on it to produce guilt, but I'm also not going to land on it and say that to say, well, it's going to always happen, so when I do it, I do it, and I'll just be all right. And we can't live flippantly either, right? Well, God's grace is there, and Paul references that. Well, does that mean you just keep on sinning? Of course not. That's not what God's grace is about. Israel's actions here, if we fast forward a little bit, they finally begin to match as they should. Now, a generation is not going to be able to enter the promised land. But the next generation is. You look in Joshua 1, and we see how they are going to finally experience some of the culmination here of what God has been bringing to their attention as to how they're to be an example, how they are to obey, and how they are to be blessed, and in doing so, bless others. Joshua 1, look at that, 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. 
no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That is sufficient. That's all they need to hear and remember. That's all we need to hear and remember. The, the Lord is with us. Has he not commanded? Has he not given us the agenda through his son Jesus Christ now of what it means to revere his holiness and obey his commands, live into his blessings, and thus bless others? Be reminded that God will be with us. Do not be discouraged. Do not live fearfully. Do not disobey and miss out on these blessings and opportunities to bless others. We can look how in Israel's purpose was not necessarily to witness verbally, but to exemplify what it means to obey God and receive his blessings. Later in Joshua 2, Rahab received the blessings of God by hearing God's story of love and provision over Israel and helping Israel enter the promised land. Ruth, later a Moabite, showed faithful love to Naomi, an Israelite. They were neither Hebrew nor Jew, but became true citizens of Israel, living into this covenant, God's covenant people. We, too, live into the covenant that is now fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Paul proclaims we are all God's children, part of God's promise through our faith in Jesus. We are heirs to God's covenantal promise. Look in Romans chapter 8, 17 and 18. Romans 8, 17 and 18. I'm thankful you're keeping the scriptures out. You're aware of them. You're looking at them. Romans 8, 17 and 18. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We are heirs of God's promises. We are to be able to live into God's blessings. We have an eternal mindset, if you remember the theme we've been focusing on this year, and how we are greatly anticipating eternity with Christ in heaven. With this mindset, with this focus, we are living into the blessings here as heaven comes down on earth. And as that obedience occurs, to experience that, we also bless others. And they, too, are invited to see what it means to live a life revering God and his holiness, a life dedicated selflessly to Jesus and his way of life and living and his commands. And as we receive the blessings from that and the promises from that, we also, in turn, bless others and invite them to experience it as well, a choice they have to make on their own. How are you blessing others by the way in which you are being obedient to what God brings to your attention? As children of God, we are instructed to obey his commands through his son, Jesus. When we do, we receive God's blessings, and his hand is upon us. Jersey has obeyed and received God's blessings in numerous ways over centuries. Most recently, we can, we can think of Stephen Ministry, a new endeavor being obedient to how to receive that blessing and bless others. You can think of the Awana ministry, how we love our children, teach them, and are blessed by that, and in turn, blessing others. We can even think of using the money that God gives us for his purposes, to go out to the ball field and have a fall festival just to level in the community or to update a facility that allows this home base atmosphere to have that welcoming spirit as we've talked about over the years. Any number of ways, and, and as we've done that, we hear the response from people inside and outside and in relationships and so forth and so on and how they're being blessed by it because we've been blessed through our obedience in it. 
It's amazing to think about, but we also have to realize that we all disobey individually, corporately. We miss opportunities. Again, not to beat ourselves up over it, but to realize when that happens, how to learn from it, how to move from it, how to continue to be obedient, remembering the blessings from obedience to propel us back into that trajectory instead, right? We can't be reluctant to embrace fresh expressions of our faith as God brings it to our attention for his purposes in real time in this context. Are you or any way you're involved in the church's ministry missing God's blessings by not being obedient, thus missing the opportunity to have others be blessed as well? If something's coming to mind through the Holy Spirit, now's the time to respond with obedience. Remember the blessings you've received individually, communally as part of the church and congregation. Remember how you have felt God's presence and been aware of his commands and the trajectory he sets you on when you are focused intently on his ways and how you're being blessed by that and thus blessing others and return to that. How do you invite others to experience God's blessings by the way in which you obey God's commands? What is it that God's bringing to your attention that you know you are to obey in your life? Meditate on it. Prayerfully consider how to obey it and not limp into it so that you can receive God's blessings and be an example for others as well. You know the story of Israel all too well and their ever ongoing ebb and flow of obedience and disobedience. We don't have to live on such a roller coaster. The power of Christ living through us shows us how to obey what Jesus is doing through us as he molds us as we are his disciples. Blessed in doing so and blessing others in doing so. Live into that this week. Recognize how we are living into God's promises by obeying Jesus and allowing him to transform us and renewing our minds, renewing our hearts, and propelling us into a future he alone ordains and welcome it with open arms so that we can live into his promises and others can as well. How will you embrace that opportunity this week? May this not be a moment where we say, yes, God, only to find a golden calf outside the door. So make the declaration you need to now, individually, and the declaration we will share as we sing communally, that we will obey God, we will live into his blessings, and we will proclaim that as we leave this place as well. And may we always say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we are hopeful for the way in which we are going to respond to your love. We say yes, that we want to obey what you are doing in our lives and how you are leading us. May we sing that, proclaim that, and pray that, and talk about that. May we embrace that and learn, and, and along the way, just, just see the abundance of blessings on us and how others are seeing your work through us as well. God, we pray for your eyes and your vision alone. In your son's name we pray. Amen.